The halogens topic is a surprisingly intricate and complicated part of your A-level, which loads of people overlook. In this tutorial, I'm going to take you through the different observations, periodicity, and reactions you need to be aware of for your A-level in chemistry in line with the OCRA specification. We're going to kick off here with what are we actually looking at? Well, the halogens exist as diatomic molecules, and they're all in a simple molecular lattice structure which means between the molecules in a sample of fluorine or bromine, we've only got London forces because the halogen molecules are nonpolar, and that's the strongest type of intermolecular force that we're going to get. London forces can also be described as induced dipole-dipole forces, and you may describe an intermolecular force as an intermolecular bond. I just don't want you to think that when we melt or boil the halogens, we're breaking covalent bonds because we definitely aren't. We're only breaking these London forces. That leads us on to the trend in the melting and boiling points. As you can see here with the chart on screen, there's an increase in the melting points and boiling points as you go down group 7 on the periodic table. This is because the number of electrons increases as you go down the group, and therefore the strength of these London forces increases. So iodine has got the highest melting point out of the four you can see here because it's got the most electrons and the strongest London forces. We also need to talk about how these three halogens appear in solution. Now, we're not just talking about how they appear in aqueous solution. We're going to be talking about how they appear in solution with a nonpolar organic solvent, like cyclohexane. The halogens are nonpolar and therefore generally have low solubility in water, which is a polar solvent. They're much more soluble in nonpolar organic solvents like cyclohexane. And this is because they are attracted by London forces to the cyclohexane molecules. Chlorine in aqueous solution, that's with water, is pale green, and it's still pale green in cyclohexane. Bromine is orange in aqueous solution, so that's with water again, and it's also orange in cyclohexane. You might see references to bromine being yellow or red, and that's because the shade that we see for the bromine around that orange colour varies with concentration. Iodine is where we see the biggest difference. Now, as I've already mentioned, it's a halogen, it's going to have lower solubility in water, and it's pale brown in aqueous solution. Because the iodine is significantly more soluble in something like cyclohexane, when you place it in cyclohexane, when you dissolve it in that, it goes to this rich purple colour, and that's because of that change in solubility. Next up, we're going to be looking at the trend in reactivity between chlorine, bromine, and iodine from the halogens group, and we're going to be associating that to redox reactions. Then I'll move on to halide ion reactions, which is like Cl- for chloride. And then finally, we'll look at an application of redox and the halogens in water treatment. But like I said, we're going to kick off with the reactivity trend of the halogens down the group using redox reactions. The halogens very often form 1- ions in redox reactions, and this is because they are oxidizing agents. The trend in their reactivity down the group is a decrease. So what I mean by that is, for example, bromine is less reactive than chlorine, but more reactive than iodine, and that's because it's in the middle of the three we're going to consider for this trend. And this is due to the decreasing ability they have to form these 1- ions in these redox reactions. Iodine is less reactive because it has a larger atomic radius and more shielding, which means therefore it's got less nuclear attraction towards the additional electron it would need to become the I- ion. And so that explains the trend in their reactivity. But how can we illustrate this? How can we showcase this trend? Well, we actually showcase the trend by reacting the halogens with other halide ions. Now, I've got three different groupings on screen here. The top two reaction equations are showing chlorine, the middle two are showing bromine, and then the bottom two are trying to show iodine, but because it's the least reactive, we don't get much reaction. In fact, we get none whatsoever in this particular combination. So as you can see from the top two reactions here, chlorine is able to oxidize both bromide and iodide ions because it's the most reactive out of the three. Bromine is unable to oxidize chloride ions, but it is able to oxidize iodide ions, and that's because it sort of sits in the middle with its reactivity. Iodine isn't able to oxidize either chloride or bromide, and that's because it's the least reactive out of the three. 
it's the least able to form those one minus ions. We use these reactions very often in exams to demonstrate the reactivity trend of the halogens. So make sure you've got these committed to memory and don't forget your halogen colors in aqueous and in solution with a non-polar organic solvent as a way of describing observations for the reactions that take place. Moving on to the next part of this, and we're going to look at testing for halide ions. Now, as you can see from the formula on the right, we're not with the halogens anymore as such, we're now with the halide ions. So we're looking at Cl- minus, Br- minus, and I- minus now. So that's chloride, bromide, and iodide respectively. Now to test for these, what I'm going to be using is aqueous silver nitrate solution. And the aqueous silver nitrate solution is providing us with these Ag plus ions, which you can see have the aqueous state symbol in these reaction equations. Now these are all ionic reaction equations, and you can see I've got each of the halide ions reacting with these silver ions, and I'm making a set of solid silver halides on the right. Those are all precipitates, and those precipitates have all got different colours that allow us to distinguish between them. In the table just here, if we did this on a test tube scale, which is qualitative analysis, practical work, for example, we would see that the three different precipitates are white, cream, and yellow, respectively. Now, that cream colour, though, for the AGBR can be difficult to spot. And so what we often discuss is the fact that we have a follow-up test here, which can be used using different concentrations of ammonia solution that can help back up which particular silver halide we've got in our test tube. For example, silver chloride, AGCL solid, is a white precipitate and it's actually soluble in any concentration of ammonia, be that dilute or concentrated. The AGCL precipitate will disappear if you add ammonia solution to it. What about AGBR? Well, it's a cream precipitate, and if you were to add dilute ammonia solution to it, well, not a lot would happen. In fact, nothing would happen at all. The precipitate would prevail, and it would stay in the test tube. If, however, you added concentrated ammonia solution to it, the precipitate would disappear, because the AGBR, that silver bromide precipitate, whilst being a cream precipitate in aqueous solution, is soluble in concentrated ammonia. What about the AGI, that silver iodide precipitate? Well, it's yellow in colour, and it's completely insoluble in either dilute or concentrated ammonia. So it's definitely not going anywhere. As you can see from the final two columns then in this table, we can use different concentrations of ammonia solution to help further distinguish between the different halide ions using this silver nitrate test once we've got the precipitates. Moving on now to disproportionation. Disproportionation by definition is when an element is both oxidized and reduced in the same reaction equation. And what we need to be aware of when it comes to the halogens topic is what happens when chlorine is added to water or when chlorine is added to sodium hydroxide. When chlorine is added to water, it produces HClO and HCl, as you can see with the top equation on screen. The oxidation numbers here show how disproportionation is taking place. Chlorine is going from zero in the Cl2 to plus one in the HClO, which is an oxidation, and also simultaneously to negative one in the HCl, which is a reduction. We can see a very similar thing taking place when chlorine is added to sodium hydroxide in the second equation, producing NaClO, NaCl, and H2O products. So what's the application of this? Well, water is often chlorinated to kill bacteria despite the potential risks. If we consider the same reaction equations in this context, when we produce the HClO when chlorine is added to water, the HClO is an oxidizing agent which kills bacteria. When we add chlorine to the sodium hydroxide in cold and aqueous conditions, sodium chlorate 1 is formed, which is also given the household name of bleach. That's because it contains the ClO minus ion, which is the chlorate 1 ion, which again is an oxidizing agent. So what to watch next? Well, now you've considered the halogens topic in more detail, I'd recommend taking a look at other periodicity content and the group two topic in much more detail. Click the link on screen now to go straight to the group two video and brush up on all your reactions there, which also includes some redox. And until next time, happy revising.